what he was accustomed to seeing. It was on that morning when Chase was seen wandering the neighborhood, checking to see if people had locked their front doors. Yo, what's up guys? My name is Real G. Welcome back to my channel. What's going on guys? Today, before we start this video, hit that like button, subscribe to my channel, you know, share my videos, man. Let's go. Thumbs up, man. Subscribe, you guys. Subscribe, subscribe. Let's go on. Before I start this video right now, I don't believe in I don't believe uh, vampires and I don't know y'all out there who believe exist vampires, you know, vampires. I don't know if all these things exist, man. But now, yo, I'm gonna react to a video that says serial killer and real life vampire Richard Trenton Chase. Grim truth. That's the truth, man. That's the vampire truth. I don't know. Let's check this out, man, and see. Let's check this out and see what it's all about. I don't know, man. You gotta see it. Richard Trenton Chase was born May 23rd, 1950 in Santa Clara, California. Chase led a relatively reclusive life until his bloodlust and taste for human flesh got the better of him later in his life. His unconventional habit earned him the nickname the Vampire of Sacramento and an unsacred reputation that lived on well past his time on this earth. Like many serial killers, Chase's path to murder and cannibalism began at an early age. His father, a notoriously strict man, often subjected the young Richard Chase to unjust physical abuse. Financial troubles only increased the tensions in the household, feeding into the rampant child abuse. His parents... This a vampire, really? Is that true? Man, I don't believe this. Really vampire? Exist? were often heard arguing by neighbors. By the age of 10, Chase had begun to exhibit evidence of the McDonald triad of sociopathy. The triad of traits includes serial bedwetting, arson, and cruelty to animals. His mother was the first to notice the strange behavior in Chase's obsession with fire. He could often be found with a book of matches burning small piles of leaves and sticks. The second red flag came when his mother cited Richard's pattern of bedwetting. Richard had been known to wet the bed into his early teens, a habit that is broken by most children by age five. While these two habits may not seem indicative of a bloodthirsty serial killer, it is the third trait of the triad that causes Richard Chase's family to seek psychiatric help for their son. One morning, Mrs. Chase was preparing to feed the family cat. She began to call for the cat, but soon noticed that he was taking much longer than usual to respond to her hails. Suspicious as to the whereabouts of her cat, Richard's mother began walking the family property in search of the pet. She soon walked up to 10-year-old Richard with the cat in hand. As she approached from behind, she thought he was simply petting it, but as she moved closer, she was horrified to find her son was wrist deep in the organs of their family feline. Before this incident, neighbors, school, friends, and even Chase's sister said that on more than one occasion, they had stumbled upon Richard capturing, torturing, and mutilating small animals. Though it was never proven, a neighborhood dog had been found in the woods eviscerated and rotting. The imprecise tears and cuts to the animal eschewed any sentiment of this being a human act of violence, but retrospectively, many believed that this was one of Chase's first victims. These persistent mutilations around the neighborhood were enough to rouse the suspicions of his mother, who began to seek the help of two different psychiatrists to help Richard. But because of financial strains, the family was unable to pay medical bills and soon lost the house and the counsel of the psychiatrists. Richard's adolescence was plagued with academic failure, substance abuse, and legal trouble. As a sophomore in high school, he was arrested for possession of marijuana. 
Once he graduated high school, his drug and alcohol habits only worsened, soon causing him to drop out of college. It was during this time he once again was put in the company of another psychologist. I need to ask a question. What does this got to do with vampire? I can't understand. It doesn't have anything to do with vampire. You really? I don't know. Let's move on and see what's happening. The first, the first psychologist that noticed dangerous signs of mental instability. Chase had multiple girlfriends since reaching a dating age, but all of these relationships failed to last. Chase noted the reason for this was because he was experiencing erectile dysfunction. Initially, psychiatrists thought that this might be a side effect of consistent substance abuse until looking into his previous psychological history. They came to the conclusion that his erectile dysfunction was either a manifestation of repressed rage or severe mental illness. It was later learned that he was only able to achieve sexual arousal through violent and disturbed acts such as mutilation, murder, and necrophilia. Chase didn't give this diagnosis any sincere thought and began to descend into a state of insanity due to his relatively unsupervised lifestyle. He began claiming that he could absorb vitamin C by placing an orange on top of his head. He also often claims that his heart had stopped beating or even that someone had stolen his pulmonary artery. His paranoia reached its peak when he moved out of his mother's house after he claimed that she was trying to poison him. This would prove to be the point where his descent into darkness was truly irreversible. At 21 years of age, Chase moved into an apartment with some friends he had met in college. His roommates described Chase's behavior as extremely unsettling and disturbing. They reported that he was often in a drug-addled state of incoherence and operated in an almost zombie-like fashion. He would lock himself in his room for days as he experimented with LSD and other illicit drugs. When he would finally exit his quarters, he would often be naked even in front of company. His concerned and frightened roommates told Chase that he had to move out if the behavior continued. When he refused, the roommates left and Chase was left alone in his apartment. It was during this time that he revisited the habit of animal mutilation, but this time with a more ravenous twist. He would hunt small animals such as cats, birds, and squirrels, and began devouring the animals in different fashions. In some cases, he would disembowel different animals and puree their organs in a blender with a Coca-Cola and then proceed to drink the concoction. Really? He believed this gory smoothie would prevent his heart from shrinking. What? His desire for blood... ...blood eventually caused him to be hospitalized when he was found unconscious in his apartment after attempting to inject rabbit's blood into his veins. While in the hospital, nurses and other staff nicknamed him Dracula after learning that he had been drinking the blood of birds and throwing them out his hospital window. Many nurses spoke of his infatuation with killing rabbits and drinking their blood. To satisfy his bloodlust, Chase claimed that he had been stealing syringes from cabinets and extracting blood from therapy dogs to drink. Doctors eventually put him in a cacophony of psychotropic drugs to combat his condition until it was believed he was no longer a threat to society. But once outside the walls of his institution, his mother slowly took him off the prescription drugs that held off the monster inside. The first sign of relapse into psychosis came when he was found wandering in the Nevada area, nude and covered in cow's blood. His first murder in his month of terror took place on December 29, 1977. His first victim was 51-year-old Ambrose Griffith, an engineer, a husband, a father, and a beloved community figure. While Griffith was fetching the groceries from his car, his wife heard two loud popping noises and turned to find her husband face down on the ground. She initially thought her husband had suffered a heart attack, but upon closer inspection, she found the body of her husband to be riddled with 22 caliber bullets. It had looked like Ambrose Griffith had been the victim of a random drive-by shooting. Chase's next victim was 22-year-old Teresa Wallen, a dedicated wife and an expectant mother. Wallen spent most of her days at home taking care of the home while her husband worked. On January 23, 1978, 
her husband would come home to find a much different sight than what he was accustomed to seeing. It was on that morning when Chase was seen wandering the neighborhood checking to see if people had locked their front doors. When he arrived at the unlocked door of Wallen's residence, he placed a 22 caliber bullet in the mailbox and entered the house. He fired upon three months pregnant Teresa Wallen multiple times. One bullet hitting her hand traveled through her elbow and grazed her neck. The next bullet. This guy is sick. He's not a Dracula. He's sick. He is definitely sick. Mental sick. Definitely. Struck her, struck her in the head. Richard then got on top of Wallen's motionless body and fired a final shot into her temple. Once she was dead, Richard raped the corpse, stabbing her numerous times with a butcher knife. He then cut off one of her nipples and began to drink her blood. After this, he cut out her kidneys and pancreas. His final act of desecration was to stuff dog feces down the throat of the mangled body. What? Upon finishing, he placed her pancreas back in her body and fled the scene. In the time between this murder and the next, Chase managed to shoot a four-month-old puppy in the head and drink its blood. Richard Chase's next and final murders happened in brief and gruesome succession. Four days after the murder of Teresa Wallen, Chase went on to massacre an unsuspecting group of four in a house just one mile down the road. Richard entered the residence of Evelyn Maroth on the morning of January 27, 1978. Upon entering the residence, he was confronted by David Meredith, a family friend of the Maroths. Richard killed Meredith with a single shot to the head. In a panic, Evelyn Maroth frantically ran to her bedroom with her six-year-old son Jason and 22-month-old David. Richard chased the trio to the bedroom where he shot the six-year-old in the head twice. He proceeded to rape Evelyn, sodomizing her with a butcher knife. Multiple stab wounds were found across Merritt's body, causing severe damage to her neck and internal organs. Chase even attempted to cut out her eye in the process. Once he was finished with the desecration of Miroth's body, he proceeded to brutally mutilate the 22-month-old child. He dragged the toddler to the bathroom where he bludgeoned him until his skull cracked open and pieces of his brain splattered into the tub. It was... What? This guy is sick, man. That, that was... He's not normal. That's, that, that was sick. That was... He's sick. He's not normal. He's out of hell. Uh, but that doesn't mean he's Dracula. He's, he's mentally... I don't know how... To, he's not normal. It was at this time, Chase heard a knock at the door. The six-year-old child had a playdate who had just arrived. In a panic, Chase grabbed the toddler's corpse and fled the scene. When he arrived back home, he continued to dissect the body, cutting open the child's head and then removing his organs, which he went on to eat. This was his final meal of human flesh as he was arrested soon after. In his panic to leave, Chase had failed to clean up the crime scene, leaving a full handprint and multiple shoe prints in Miroth's blood. In the days following his arrest, police were able to find the body of the toddler in a cardboard box in a vacant lot between a nearby supermarket and church. The state pursued the death sentence, which they were able to achieve in less than five hours of deliberation. Chase attempted to plead insanity due to his history of mental instability, but his plea was denied. While awaiting death, Chase was put back onto his antipsychotic drugs, which he covertly collected for several weeks. The day after Christmas in 1980, the lifeless body of Richard Chase was found in his cell by prison guards. Chase had committed suicide the night before by using weeks worth of stockpiled prescription medication. The Sacramento vampire was dead. Richard Trenton Chase was born with a darkness that only blood could quell. A life of turmoil and abuse only fanned the flames of his murderous rage, and it led to the most gruesome murders California had ever seen up to that point. Wow. That was so bad, man. That was so bad. But, um... <clears throat> my own opinion is just mentally sick, man. Mentally sick dangerous person and mentally sick. But that doesn't mean he's a Dracula. I don't know what they mean by Dracula, but um, 
anyways that was that was so short that was creepy man it's not good killing people eating their flesh eating their own oh, organs and everything no it's something else it's not normal anyways thank you guys for watching this is my reaction don't forget to subscribe give it a thumbs up and share my videos man thank you guys peace out